Okay, so quick overview on the assessment um, of uh, biomechanical assessment in the periphery. Now, if you look at this flow chart, you've seen it before. In fact, this is exactly the same flow chart you saw before for the spine, except I've gone in there and changed a few of the labels. Um, so this should be a big stretch for you understanding this at all, so we can whip through this. So um, the biggest difference here is the naming. So you'll see PPM, which is Okay, so we've come to talk about subluxations here. In the periphery, the subluxation is a little different than they are in the um, spine. Just to review, in the spine, we talked about this being a flexion subluxation or an extension subluxation, which probably isn't quite true. This is abnormal flexion or abnormal extension. It just goes off the rails a bit because of the degeneration. Um, in this periphery, we have an adequate. Okay, so a quick overview of the treatment. Um, along the top, you can see the dysfunctions that we're going to find. Pericapture hypomobility, pathomechanical hypomobility, hypertonicity causing hypomobility, adhesions or scars, and instability. And we're going to have a quick look to see the principles of treatment of these, treatment of these with manual therapy. So with pericapture restrictions, um, you're going to have to mobilize this, and it's going to have to be Okay, so we're going to manipulate the joint. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. We're not talking about loose body manipulations, um, but subluxation manipulations. So we can either directly manipulate the restricted motion. Um, for example, a carpal that's gone dorsal, we can basically thrust it palmally. Now, this is generally done under distraction. The mechanic, biomechanics we learned previously, how to apply conjunct rotation, degrees of freedom, surface shapes, and directions of arthrokinematics versus osteokinematics. And we'll use the elbow as an example. The elbow, elbow is an interesting joint, which is code for complicated. Um, there's obviously three joints involved in this. Actually, there's four if you include the inferior um, radiola joint, but we'll keep it a bit more simple than that, and we'll say there's three joints involved here. And each one has its own biomechanics. So assessing and treating this joint is interesting, to say the least. Um, it'll stretch you a little bit, but not terribly much. Elbow is an interesting joint, as we said before. Um, there's three joints you have to consider, ulna, humeral, radio humeral, radio ulna. We're going to ignore the inferior radio ulna, which has to be assessed with the elbow but for the purposes of uh, this uh, discussion, we're going to ignore it. It just makes it more complicated than it needs to be. So, um, whenever we're assessing this, you have to consider the biomechanics. For example, it is impossible to assess biomechanically the entire elbow in one sitting. Um, you can get a crack at it with the um, quadrant test, um, but it really doesn't do it completely the way we want it to be. The reason for this is that the onohumeral joint has a different conjunct rotation to the radiohumeral joint, a completely opposite direction. So that if I gain full flexion, for example, of the onohumeral joint, I cannot at the same time get full flexion of the radiohumeral joint. So these joints have to be assessed separately. So let's start with the onohumeral joint. Um, Structurally, this is a modified cellar. Um, it's got one degree of freedom, flexion and extension. Now, the conjunct rotations for these are rotations with the ulna. So as we flex the elbow, the ulna will rotate laterally. Or if you prefer, full flexion of the ulnohumeral joint requires full supination of the forearm. Uh, for extension, the conjunct rotation of the arm is medial, that is, it puts the arm into pronation. So again, to get full um, extension of the onohumeral joint, you have to incorporate full pronation. If you can't assess the full range, you can't assess the limited range. So these conjunct rotations have to be included. So the have an adduction component, which normally would only be considered the conjunct rotation, is the so important biomechanically that it is considered as a separate degree of freedom and it's assessed as such. So functionally, this would be a, um, an unmodified cellar with two degrees of freedom, 
flexion extension and abdomen adduction. And it's the abdomen adduction that gets affected with biomechanical dysfunction of the elbow, not the flexion extension. The flexion extension is severely bothered by arthritis, arthrosis, fractures, that type of thing, medical pathologies um, that causes severe limitation of movement here. But for the end range motions of biomechanical dysfunction, it's the abdomen adduction. So this has to be assessed as a separate range of motion. So the passive physiological movement assessment of the ulnar humeral joint will be flexion supination, which um, requires both movements to go to its full range, and extension pronation. Um, now, for ab and adduction, you will assess ab and adduction as a passive physiological movement for the um, ulnar humeral joint. For the PAN, the arthrokinematic test, flexion and extension will be an anterior and posterior glide respectively. Well, abduction, and that's because the, for flexion and extension, the um, olecranon presents a concave surface to the trochlea. So the arthrokinematic is in the same direction as the osteokinematic. That means that abduction must be a male surface presented to a female surface, as far as the owner is concerned. So the convex surface of the owner will glide in the opposite direction to the movement. So abduction of the um, forearm of the owner will be a lateral movement. So the glide has to be medial. And for adduction, the glide has to be lateral. Now, abducted owners tend to be a lot more common than Sorry, abducted ulnars tend to be a lot more common than do adducted. And these are often asymptomatic causes of a tennis elbow. So you've got to get used to doing this. You must assess the medial glide to see if you can get adduction. If you can't, then you have an abducted ulnar. For the uh, radiohumeral joint, we're looking at uh, biomechanics. So this now is structurally a, um, an unmodified ovoid. Um, if you look at it, you'll see that it makes almost uh, the capitulum is almost a perfect sphere, and the um, radial head is almost the inverse of this with a concavity. However, it can't function as an unmodified ovoid with three degrees of freedom because it's attached to the ulna. So the ulna will limit its ability to go through three degrees of freedom and also modify what it does. So. Functionally, this is a modified ovoid with two degrees of freedom, flexion, extension, and spin. Um, and the conjunct rotations of this is um, for flexion um, at the radiohumeral joint, you have to do pronation with the flexion in order to get the radial head as far up the capitulum as it can go. So the full range of motion, motion test is flexion pronation for, and extension supination. For pronation and supination, there is no glide because it's a spin. So your test for this ability to spin is distraction. And you can either do that with the capsule tightened up in the direction that you're interested in, say pronation, and then fill the end fill for that distraction and then the amount of movement, and then compare it to the other side and you feel to see if you'll see in the same end fill and movement there. Um, the passive physiological movements uh, for um, this joint then is going to be um, flexion pronation, extension supination, and the glides will be um, superior, moving the ulna superiorly along the capitulum for flexion and inferiorly for extension, um, and the glide, as I say, for um, pronation supination is distraction. For the radial joint, we're just going to consider the superior one now. Um, the biomechanics of this is the, the surface shape is actually a modified ovoid. So it should have two degrees of freedom, but because of its attachment to the ulna, it loses um, one of the degrees of freedom. And, and basically, it's, it's the degree of freedom that's allowed is pronation and supination. Now, at the radial ulna joint, superior radial ulna joint, the radius presents a convex surface to the ulna. At the inferior joint, it presents a concave surface. So if you consider both of these joints together, 
The superior one is um, convex from the radius's point of view, and it's concave in the inferior. So you have a concave or convex surface that makes it a cellar joint. It's a modified cellar joint functionally. So um, it can do pronation and supination. Now the glides at the superior joint are in the opposite direction to the osteokinematic. So for um, your PPM is basically pronation and supination. That's it. So to glide it to see if they uh, if the joint has full range of um, pronation, you have to consider the direction of movement of the bone. So the, with pronation, the radius moves. Um, ventral medially so the glide must be dorsolateral uh, for supination it's a it's a dorsolateral osteokinematic so it must be a ventral medial glide of the radius there okay so i'm hoping that this has given you um, an idea of transforming your theoretical knowledge of biomechanics into the practical application of technique. Um, and this applies to all of the joints. You have to understand the biomechanics in order for you to do the techniques without being a technician. Sure, you can just go in there and do all the techniques we show you. You know, it's quite a figure of memory to do that. But if you can understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, then um, you don't have to remember it. You just do it. And you can also innovate, produce new techniques that are better for you and better for the profession sometimes. Somebody has to invent these techniques and there's no reason why it shouldn't be you. Okay, so um, take care, everybody, and I'll talk to you again. Bye-bye.